Thank you, buddy. All right, now let's see if the clicker works. Great. Good morning, Austin. Uh, this is, uh, this is um, consistently my favorite DevOps days. Don't tell anybody else that, but uh, you guys really do a, a great job here, and I'm happy to be back. Am I too loud? Seems very loud up here. No? Okay. I'm just going to have to <laughs> roll with it. So uh, an odd thing happened uh, on the way to this talk. Literally yesterday, I tweeted this in like February, and uh, February 4th to be precise, and suddenly like in Twitter life, it just came back yesterday. I have all these retweets and whatever, which is funny because this is literally the thesis of my, um, of my, my talk. So my talk is really about operations, right? And if you think about operations today, it's becoming a far more distributed activity. In a lot of ways, it's kind of like what happened to QA, right? It used to be one person's problem. Now it's we find it being distributed uh, throughout an organization. Generally, there's still an operations organization of some sort or name, but um, you know, we're seeing the rise of, I guess, or the spreading of operational control. But what hasn't changed is what it's like to work in operations, right? What it feels like to be, to be there, right? You know, the first one is, um, you know, that the constant feeling of being, oh, it's overloaded, right? That uh, whether it's, uh, you know, interruptions from uh, tickets or just someone stopping by your cube or an alarm going off you've got to go see, we're constantly fighting fires at the same time. There's the projects that were due yesterday. There's the projects that are due tomorrow. Um, it's a constant feeling of putting out fires and, and too many things, uh, things going on. That hasn't changed. Uh, you know, we're constantly waiting in, uh, in queues for everything, right? Whether that's, uh, you know, us waiting for somebody else to do something for us, right? Or uh, that almost worse feeling, which is all these people are waiting on us to do things, right? There's a, you know, kind of a massive jam in our, in our, in our queue. And then, of course, things break. They break again. They keep breaking, uh, <laughs> breaking again, right? And, uh, you know, this repetitive feeling of we're chasing the same problems. We have to deal with the same issues over and over again. And this kind of sinking feeling that, you know, uh, everyone's busy, but things aren't really getting better, right? We're constantly overloaded with, uh, you know, business delivery projects, improvement projects. Um, it's kind of like everyone's working at 110% of capacity, um, but we don't seem to be getting ahead of the, uh, of the curve. Does it seem familiar to anybody on the operations world? Yeah, I see some nodding heads here, right? And then, for good measure, right, in come the executives, right, with their nice seagull, right, of, uh, hey, everything takes too long, costs too much, you know, breaks too often, uh, you know, what are you doing about that, right? So that really doesn't make us feel any, uh, any better. But then there's this kind of rumblings off on the horizon, right? This idea of SRE starts, uh, starts coming up. You know, we've got the Google books. I uh, actually wrote a chapter in the first non-Google book from uh, O'Reilly, small plug there, seeking SRE. Um, and... Uh, you know, we're getting all these uh, ideas of, well, what is SRE, right? Some people are saying, well, it's when you ask so software engineers to do operations. Other folks are saying, well, it's when, you know, ops does, you know, more engineering uh, than classic ops work. Uh, you know, there's this kind of fun idea of class SRE implements DevOps, right? It's, a, it's an operation-specific implementation of DevOps. And it's really, or some people say it's, it's, the, it's the, you know, cloud-native architecture. Well, this is the cloud-native kind of style of doing, of doing operations. But for most people, it feels a little bit too good to be true, right? Like, how does that actually work? How do you actually spend more of your time doing engineering work than all that firefighting that we're buried, uh, we're buried under? And see this new trend, which is companies come up and they go, well, hey, this sounds great, right? Uh, you know, maybe we should do SRE because Google does it, and uh, it's going to be great, right? And so this idea generally comes up to say, well, all right, you know, we've got sysadmins, right? Let's just make them SREs, right? How hard can it, uh, how hard can it be? It's magic, right? <laughs> so, but then, this is the re then the reality sets in, right? Which it's really a lot more like this, right? Which is... Uh, you know, you're buried in your, your cab reviews, and you've got all your ticket queues, and your, what is your ITIL processes, and someone comes on in and says, hey, you're now an SRE, you know, write code and be better at operations, right? It just doesn't, and so we know how this goes, right? I'm sure you all do. You know, think about overloaded, everything always waiting in queues, things breaking, breaking again, not enough time to get things done, right? That was the old way. Now with these new SRE titles, guess what we got? The exact same thing, right? We're right back to where we uh, started. Um, although one thing, which is all those people you changed their titles, now are doing really well on LinkedIn, and they're going to go find jobs somewhere, <laughs> somewhere else. So they'll thank you, uh, just, so you <laughs> just so you know. A little trick for anybody who wants to change their, change their company. 
Uh, so you know, the reality is changing the reality is changing job titles and adding individual skills doesn't make systems administrators SREs, right? You know, sure, everybody loves this idea of like, oh, it'd be great. You know, who doesn't want new programming skills, learn things like observability and uh, distributed systems architectures, blameless postmortems. Like, those are all great things to learn. Everybody wants to learn that. But the reality is, if you don't take care of all of these this conditions, how it's like to actually work in operations, we're not doing SRE, right? We just have long-suffering systems administrators with a new title that are about to go get a 25% pay raise, right? So the reality is, you know, SRE is a... Um, it's a rethinking of how operations actually, actually works, right? And I think that's is the, really the key thing to get across. And if you go right to the Google definition of SRE, um, I think it's great because they've got these three principles of what actually SRE is all about. And Stephen Thorne at uh, the DevOps Enterprise Summit in 2018 in London did a great talk uh, on, on this in depth. I'll kind of give you the, the highlight of it because I think it's, it's important. Number one, SREs need service level objectives with consequences, right? So what is a service level objective, right? It looks a lot like an SLA to start, right? Um, it's got this idea that there is some business indicator, uh, you know, that's sort of a customer impact or a business outcome, and uh, there's somewhere between zero and, you know, say perfect. Uh, what is the agreed upon um, the agreed upon uh, performance, right? You know that is a service level objective, right? So it seems kind of normal uh, so far. But what first thing that's very interesting about it is these things are that delta between perfection and the service level objective is called an error budget, right? E R R O R, not A I R. And the error budget is saying, well, that's that's that's. Capital. That's we should be using that, right? If we don't, we don't need perfection here. We need just to be comfortably above that SLO. So we should be investing that and in moving faster as a company. We should be investing in experimenting and trying new things, or just leave it alone and use that capital somewhere, uh, somewhere, uh, somewhere else. So that's kind of you know seems a lot like similar to to a uh, an SLA. But where things really get different is that an SLA is generally something that's put onto operations, right? It's a penalty. It's like saying that under the threat of this penalty, you are going to perform in such a way and you're going to maintain this service to a certain, to a certain, uh, a certain service level, right? And what's really kind of fundamentally different about the whole SLO uh, way of thinking is that it's actually about driving a shared responsibility. So the organizations that really push this, this is an agreed upon contract, if you'd, if you'd say, between dev, the business, and ops, right? And then SLO takes priority. So if the SLO is blown, right, it falls below that, that air budget's blown, we fall below the SLO, it's not operations sole responsibility to solve that problem, everybody has to stop and swarm to move that problem. Because the reality is we're not in the business, and most people are not in the business of writing software, we're in the business of running services. So the service isn't performing above that SLO, everything stops, we try to figure out how do we solve that problem. And that even means that uh, the business has to be okay with not pushing new features, right? Not moving forward. And that's a hard thing to do, especially in a large organization, to say, yeah, I know people are, want X, Y, and Z, but until we get this SLO above board, we're not, we're, not going, uh, we're not going forward. So that idea of the SLO taking priority is really that kind of big departure from the classic SLA uh, thinking. It's a very powerful tool because it's a way for, to keep that uh, shared responsibility going uh, in an organization. It takes all that pressure off of the traditionally would-be operations responsibility only. Uh, second, which is probably the most uh, important to me, is uh, this idea of toil, right? Or I should say at least, uh, how do I go back? Whoops, sorry. Moment, there we go. Fundamentally, the idea that SREs need to have time to make tomorrow better than today, right? And really what this is talking about is this idea of toil, right? And toil is just a great word that's uh, kind of come up on, uh, in vogue lately, but it really gets a good name on a problem that we've all felt, right? And I think Vivek Rao from Google does the best job of just succinctly describing this, or sort of succinctly. But he says, toil is the kind of work tied to running a production service that tends to be manual, repetitive, automatable, right? Tactical, the key one here, devoid of enduring value, right? And scales linearly as the service grows, right? So the idea here is that it's the stuff that should be automated, it's the stuff that it might be necessary. You might have to do it to keep the lights on, but we're not adding value to the business. We're not, we're not moving the ball forward in doing this work, right? So if we're constantly doing a lot of repetitive work, we're doing manual work, things the machine should be doing for us, yes, it is necessary. Yes, it's something that we have to do at that time and we should value that work, but we should also feel a little bit dirty, right? We should feel like, ooh, this is not, this is not moving the business forward 
that's toil. That's what we want to have to have uh, to have less of. And the opposite of toil is engineering work, right? And the difference is engineering work is about building that enduring value, right? It's about instead of oh we're just keeping the lights on, treading water in place. It's oh we're doing something to make tomorrow better than today. We're adding value to the to the company. And you can look at toil tends to be you know kind of rote, repetitive work. Engineering work is creative, iterative, right? It's the things that the machines can't do, right? It's where we need human creativity. So, uh, and also another key indicator of toil is scale, right? That toil scales with the scaling, right? So if we have a thousand users and then tomorrow we have a million users and we had to add, uh, you know, dozens of people to keep up with that, there's a lot of toil in the system, right? Versus engineering work is work we can do that enables that scaling, it enables us to scale without that linear growth in uh, adding more, more humans. And What's really important here, the toil, is the balance, right? The idea that uh, it, um, the point of that engineering work is twofold. Number one, what I talked about is moving the business forward. But number two is it's the only way to reduce toil is to have engineering capacity to actually go and, and apply that to the, uh, to the system. Because what happens if you, uh, if you don't, um, that engineering work gets crowded out, and you end up where, in a condition where you see a lot of uh, a lot of enterprise operations organizations where it's all toil, right? And they don't have the capacity not only to move the business forward, but they're lacking the capacity to actually start to fight back that and eliminate that toil. And this downward spiral is inevitable where you're stuck in this tailspin where you're constantly in this state of chasing all that toil and you can't get, uh, you can't get out of it. So that balance is very, is very important. So that's uh, making tomorrow better than today. And then the third, um, principle is SRE teams have to have the ability to regulate their, their workload. And this is a very interesting one. Um, it's the ability to say, you know, how easily can an operations side of the, of the house say no to something, right? Um, and a good example of this, uh, you know, it's, you see some organizations that have that, still have that split between development and operations. Google is, uh, is, is one of them. But they've separated the idea of uh, going to production from being owned by operations, right? So what if handing off responsibility to operations wasn't a right. Just to say, oh, we're going live in production uh, next month. And the operations side of the house can say, well, that's fine, but you take care of it because you haven't met our, 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 our criteria for stability or for um, you know, a, a performance that, that will take that on, that, that, that responsibility. So this idea of being able to separate running in production you know, from being run by SRE or operations is uh, you know, a fundamental idea that kind of breaks the thinking of a lot of uh, traditional operations, uh, you know, organ organizations. And, uh, you know, it, it brings up all sorts of issues with compliance, with security, with how could that possibly happen? It's, a, it's immoral, right? Um, you know, the reality is, uh, you know, you see organizations that are doing this today by their focus on their platforms and how they just define their responsibility. But it's just an example of, you know, what can you do, uh, you know, how uh, examples of that SREs have to have the right to uh, the, the ability to regulate their, their workload. So that's the three kind of principles, right? And you can see that's really the fundamental departure from kind of classic operations thinking is those, those principles. So we're going to talk about where to start, right? Uh, the practical approach. So there's kind of three, again, the three uh, principles we talked about. So here people kind of in the purist side of the house say, well, number one is the most important. That if we don't have those service level objectives, we're not really doing SRE. If we don't have those, excuse me, the consequences is the important part that goes with those SLOs, meaning that shared responsibility, then we don't really have, uh, have, uh, have SRE. But the reality is, you know, that's an organizational kind of company-wide culture change, and that's hard probably not the best place to lead, right? They might think you've kind of lost your, uh, lost your mind a little bit. Um, you know, the second one, or the third one, I should say, uh, down there, the SRE teams have the ability to regulate their workload. That's another company-wide culture change, right? Telling people, oh, that we're going to change responsibilities, we're going to fundamentally break this, this, this idea that only operations can own and manage things in, in production, or the fact that operations can push back and say, no, this isn't ready to go. It's a tough battle to, uh, to fight. So the one I always recommend, I see organizations have the, the most success, w success with, is starting with this idea of reducing toil, right? Everybody wins when we focus in on that, uh, you know, how to make tomorrow better than, better than today. And if I want to talk about why that is, um, number one, there's lots of value independent of SRE. You don't have to say the word SRE to anybody, right? Everybody likes the idea of wouldn't we like to have more capacity to make tomorrow better than today, 
right? It's, it's a fundamental statement people aren't gonna disagree with. You can make a lot of progress, build a lot of human capital, a lot of, excuse me, a lot of capital in your, uh, political capital in your organization by just focusing on we're going to, uh, you know, create, the, create more time for ourselves to get the, the things done that we always wanted to do and we can't get to because we're buried in this stuff called, called, uh, called toil. And number two, our people are our most expensive assets, right? You know, think about it's the hardest thing to recruit for. It's the number one thing on top of the, uh, the, the budget is, is the people. So, you know, how about we stay out of their way? How about we figure out how can we get the most human capital out of our human capital? And uh, again, another idea that's if you can, you know, show some competency in it is uh, seems like a no duh, but you can really make a lot of progress, uh, progress with it. So how to start reducing, reducing toil, right? Uh, number one, seems a little bit obvious, but start tracking toil, right, uh, for, each, uh, for each team. A lot of organizations fundamentally don't, don't do this. And, you know, how to go about doing that. Uh, number one, you gotta standardize, right? This is something that, that is an interesting uh, thing that a lot of organizations don't have a really, a, a, a clear kind of group understanding of how to classify what kind of work is what, right? Uh, you know, for example, like, people say like meetings, right, or email, or filling out expense reports, right? Oh, that's toil, right? It's a waste of time. And it's like, well, we, we want to separate that out, right? So let's call that overhead. It's a different kind of waste. We want to talk about it, but it's not toil per se, right? Toil is more like actual work, the work that we do, and is it adding enduring value or is it not adding enduring value? But being able to standardize, just come up with a definition uh, is incredibly important to start talking about it. Um, in terms of, uh, of tracking, right? most successful things I've seen is really, it doesn't have, it's, it's more of a sampling, right? So it could be self-reporting, um, you know, periodic surveys sent out to the different teams to figure out where they're, where they're at. Um, scrum masters or, um, uh, you know, project managers are kind of useful in this regard. Well, interview, do sampling, figure out on a team by team basis how much of the work is falling into this toil bucket, how much would, would you describe in this engineering work. Uh, work bucket and going back to that standardization is very important for them to teach them how to really spot what the difference is because a lot of times toil it feels like well that's my job I just get a shovel and I dig and I move the pile from this side of the room to that side of the room and then I go back and I move it back to the other side of the room you know metaphorically that's that's what I do and the reality is yes and that is important maybe we have to do that to keep the lights on the business but they have to understand that fundamentally we want to get you out of that we want to apply your brain to something more creative uh, than that so having, you know, kind of that common idea or having a, a team that kind of can fan out and really kind of explain, you know, and divide and understand kind of what different work classifications are is very important. But you can't get lost in the time tracking weeds. Uh, that's probably the worst things I've seen, which is, oh, we're going to now do this really granular time tracking and please tell me in 20 minute increments, you know, what you're doing with your day. Complete waste of time. We don't need that level of detail. It's more just we want a general sense for what is, uh, you know, is, uh, is going on per, per team. So that's tracking. Um, second is, you know, setting a toil limit for each team. The conventional wisdom right now is 50%, right? How to get balance between, you know, the toil work and the engineering work. Uh, your mileage may vary. 50% seems like it's working pretty well for folks who focus on that. And then funding the efforts to reduce the toil, right? Uh, with the emphasis on the teams already over the limit. And something I'm kind of seeing is organizations that, that make an official program for this, tend to be the most successful. Those who don't, it never really gets solved, right? It's like, they feel bad about themselves. Oh gee, it's all toil, but you know, we're just buried in it, and we're buried in it tomorrow, and it will be kind of forever. Um, there was a great talk at SRECon just recently, uh, Michael Kehoe and Todd Polino from uh, LinkedIn, they called it Code Yellow. That's their formal program uh, for uh, LinkedIn for identifying when a team is struggling, when that toil to engineering work is out of balance and how they go about it. It's not rocket science, it's not nothing that's really uh, kind of earth shattering, but it's just a really kind of interesting look on, you know, this is how they go about it. And by making an official program, they get that emphasis. And, uh, you know, fun little side fact, Code Yellow, if you've, if you've ever, has ever worked around a hospital, that means like get ready for a disaster, <laughs> right? So I'm not sure if they chose it that way or not, but, um, you know, that is a... Uh, kind of what they're implying is if we don't solve this problem, we have a disaster that's coming our, uh, that's coming our way. So well, where are you gonna focus, right? Okay, so great, we've figured out, all right, you know, what our, our, our toil uh, um, balance is, and we're starting to think about, well, where do, we, you know, where do we apply this work, right? The first one is reducing technical debt, right? Pretty obvious. 
Second one is you can actually often just re-engineer processes to get rid of it, right? Why don't we just distribute who does what, when, and where? Often we'll stop a lot of those interruptions and a lot of that kind of pushing toil onto other organizations, things that can be solved upstream or, or downstream a lot better. Now, these two things are very organization specific, so I'm not gonna act like I have any uh, insight specifically how to go about that. But what is pretty universal um, that I do wanna spend the rest of my time talking about is the idea of enabling uh, self-service, right? And think about self-service, think about all the things you need to do in, um, in an operation sense where it usually involves a ticket, right? Or something you need someone to do for you, right? Every time that happens, you're injecting uh, interruptions into somebody else's life, right? And you're probably putting waiting onto yourself, right? And on a one-to-one -one relationship, it doesn't seem to be too bad, but as that scales out and fans out across an organization, it just, the, the, it's death by a thousand cuts, right? The interruptions pile up, the waiting piles up, and uh, all the other the work those people could be doing is you know, kind of burning in the background while we're in that cycle of these, of these repetitive, uh, repetitive requests. So obvious answer, let's get rid of those interruptions and get rid of those, uh, that waiting, and that's where the idea of self-service comes in. How do you let the people or experts set up for the people who have the repetitive requests so they can handle things them, uh, themselves? Less waiting, less interruptions, a whole lot less, uh, less toil. So how do you enable self-service, right? Um, there's kind of two ways to go for anything in IT, right? There's the big major top-down approach, uh, large projects, large platforms, and then there's the bottom-up approach, right? And we found that in reducing toil by enabling self-service, getting rid of the interruptions and the waiting works best if you empower people in the organization to find and uh, fix these problems themselves. All those little instances of, of, uh, of where you know, they're interrupting somebody or there's waiting that's coming back at, that's coming back at them, um, by injecting self-service, we can you know, spot these anti-patterns and get things, uh, get things done. So let me give some examples of these, kind of the most popular anti-patterns that, uh, that we see. One we already talked about here, which is the you know, do it for me, do it again, then do it again, right? The constant repetitive requests to do the, uh, the same things, often a ticket system involved. Uh, ticket queues are evil, that's a whole nother, uh, a whole nother talk. <laughs> Uh, so obviously with the self-service, what we're doing is, you know, we're enabling people to do it themselves, right? Which is a little bit of a Tom Sawyer move, right? You're making them do it themselves. But the reality is they don't have to wait, they'll like that. And I'm keeping all of that extra is interruptions, all that toil off of my specialists or off of my other, my other uh, teams. Uh, another place where it really comes into, into handy is this idea of like, well, I could fix to it, fix it, but I can't get to it. Big enterprises, lots of silos, or any company, lots of organizational boundaries, compliance boundaries, security boundaries, that you know we have to inject interruption on somebody else because of these boundaries. We can't get around them. We can't just give everybody root access, right? And uh, you know, so another example where self-service comes in uh, comes in uh, comes in handy. Um, we're getting rid of the, all those. We're not in, in interrupting people. We're not injecting that on them, and we're not waiting. We're staying out of people's uh, people's way. The dog pile is a fun one. How many folks have ever been on like a bridge call, right? Something's going wrong and somebody goes, oh, it's that database, right? And you log in and you run top, right? The first 10 things you see are your other 10 colleagues running top, right? You know, so it's the dog pile, right? And, and A, it's annoying, it doesn't, you can't get anything done, but B, it's a bigger problem where you start stepping on people's toes and you know, we have mis mis information, uh, miscommunication, but you know, using kind of a self-service mechanism, um, Oops, sorry. We're using a self-service mechanism, we can kind of keep people aligned, which not only helps us get rid of this toil, this interruption that's, that's, that we're faced with right now, but it stops us from making it worse, right? And along the same lines of making it worse, another favorite one, I'm an expert. I don't read that wiki, right? So, you know, like, uh, we're just moving fast, microservices, it's awesome, right? Kubernetes, you know, and it's, uh, but we change these things, right? And we say, oh, well, if you're gonna restart this, right, you've gotta use this particular flag or set this new environment variable, otherwise bad things will happen, right? And then the knocks all mad, because they're like, hey, every time you do, some, you do a restart, you know, we spend 20 minutes running around thinking the world's ending until we realize that it was just, so we're gonna restart, right? So what do they do? They, oh, they put it in the wiki, they put it into Slack, they send out an email, they mention, mention it to you when you're getting coffee, right? But then three in the morning, you know, alarm goes off, your pager duty lights up, right? You're like, oh, I've done this before, I don't need to read the wiki. You do the restart, you don't use the right environment variables, you don't do the new knock monitoring, you know, quiet procedure, and you've caused a bigger problem, right? 
versus self-service, you can get it done. Everybody can collaborate on what is that best procedure um, or what is the way we want to do things. And then when you roll out of bed at 3 in the morning, you don't have to think, what did the firewall, rule, firewall team tell me? You know, what's that new flag? Um, it's just all there, there for you. Um, last one here, which happens time and time again, you know, this idea that, oh, there's a problem that happens, and we find it, right, in production, and we're going to drive it back through the, uh, the, the development life cycle, and we're going to, uh, you know, get a permanent fix for this, right? But you know how life goes. There's only so much time, only so much money. So, um, you know, we do it over and over again, and then we go, <coughs> excuse me, we go, well, can we get a permanent fix for this? And someone says, oh, there's no budget, right? And this happened to, uh, I was talking to a company the other day, it was an insurance company, and their first kind of self-service thing they did that, that, they, that they fell in love with was they had this problem where they would route uh, this, this web app that would route uh, insurance policies for, uh, through this, um, through this uh, uh, underwriting process. And if somebody walked away without releasing the policy, it did a database level lock on the policy and you couldn't, and, and the only way to fix it was to raise a P1 bug with their like three person strong uh, DBA team, and this is 24 seven operation, they're getting 30 to 40 wake up, you know, 30 to 40 P1 bugs a month. They would go to the development side of the house and they go, well, you have a workaround for it and we're gonna rebuild this system in the next you know, two years, which you know is never gonna happen. Uh, so you just keep doing your thing, no budget, bug closed, right? And so what they did is they just said the first self-service job they created was the idea of saying, well, let the customer service agents have this web form where they can just say, hey, well, you know, this is the policy number, and it would run a job that would check and see if the policy is locked. It would then unlock the uh, uh, unlock it, and uh, oh, it would open a ticket and close a ticket without anybody ever ever seeing it, and it solved the problem, right? So this is that idea that now we can, you know, we we have to. It's a it's kind of a, a stopgap way of, uh, you know, how do we solve those known issues so they don't keep coming back on us while the rest of the business figures itself out. So, in a nutshell, you know, seeing the successful, uh, you know, kind of self-service uh, operations. It's kind of the, 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 the name on the design pattern that us at Rundeck have been promoting because we just kind of see this brewing in the community. The necessary elements, you know, it's pull-based, right? That it's, uh, you know, things you can use on demand. Um, you know, the key one is accepting what tools and languages the team wants to use. Right, so not imposing to say you must learn this new DSL or you must all be in Ansible, it must all be in Ruby, it must all be in PowerShell, it must all be Chef or Puppet. You know, let people use what they want to use. Define those guardrails so people can, you know, uh, work safely, and let the people who push the buttons also create their own buttons. You know, let them check check in their own jobs and kind of go through things that way. And really, self service is ultimately about user experience. Right, something we forget about in operations all the time which is it's not an automation problem. We've got 19 different tools and, and languages and ways, and most people have all 19, to uh, move the bits. But it's about how do you create the human to tool experience, right? How do you let people work the way that they want to, uh, that they want to work? How do you set up smart options, you know, guardrails, we call them, right, that will let people pick the right things, even if they're experts, right? People want to be guided, say this is the, you know, I don't need to know all 100 flags, I need to know the three that I actually have to, uh, have to care about, right? Or, I, or I, I don't need to know all the names of the different of the different uh, environments I can be doing this in. I just want a, a list that tells me what's currently available, and the ability to have also a dynamic resource model, right? Everything's changing so fast that the part of the user experience problem is people not knowing where is what and what state things are are in. So it's got a couple minutes left. So I just wanted to uh, you can there's links to these, um, but you know it's very fascinating. We've seen you know uh, self service be used in a strategic way. Uh, uh, in a very interesting, so there's benefits to not just the bottom up. Um, I've talked about this one before, but uh, you can go watch in, uh, Jody Mulkey's talk from Ticketmaster. They had a major problem where they had 47 minute MTTR, which is a huge deal when you can't print, you know, playoff tickets or people can't buy their Adele tickets or whatever it might it might be. And by applying self-service, by pushing control closer to the people who see the problems, by allowing the experts to kind of encapsulate their operational procedures and push them towards the NOC, push them towards the level one and level two teams. In the course of like 18 months, they got their MTTR down to 3.8 minutes, right? Purely from, uh, and they also, an important part too is uh, they reduce their escalations by half. Right, so the operators, the L1 people are happy because they're actually solving problems. Uh, the uh, development folks are happy because all of the, uh, they're not getting all those interruptions. And the business is happy because stuff's being solved faster and it's cheaper to, uh, to do. It's a great talk. Uh, another one was at the DevOps uh, Enterprise Summit last year, Sean Norris, Standard Chartered, 165-year-old uh, bank. The bank predates light bulbs, 
right? Queen Victoria signed their charter, 86,000 employees. The whole thing was in 60 countries, right? The whole thing is built for compliance of regulations, right? And, uh, you know, they use self-service as a way to really break that logjam, right? To, number one, allow people in Malaysia to, you know, uh, operators in Malaysia or systems administrators in, in, in Malaysia to work on, uh, you know, people's accounts or systems that are actually managing for Indonesia, right? It's a huge compliance issues. They use it as a strategic way to put consistency across, across the organization, but also to break that compliance logjam, save 28 people a year's worth of time just from, you know, kind of enabling self-service, enabling people to get things, uh, to get things done. And uh, it's a really fascinating talk. There's some crazy things like uh, in the previous regime when they had to um, do anything in production, you actually had to uh, screen record your entire session and then your manager had to watch that entire session within 24 hours of you <laughs> doing it. And they had 13,000 of, of those in a year. So, you know, but things you do when you're built for compliance, in a new world you're trying to build for speed, uh, the self-service capability allowed them to get rid of all of that. So, recap. Uh, SRE is more than just a job title, right? Um, I can't stress that. Uh, I can't stress that uh, enough. I guess that's not that different than you know saying DevOps is not a job title. Um, SRE is a new way to think about operations work, right? Uh, you know, think about those three principles. How does it apply to what you do? The error budgets and toil limits is a very imp impactful way to look at the uh, to look at the world. Uh, you know, be practical. I, I recommend start by looking at toil, especially if you're in a legacy or kind of enterprise uh, environment. You can get huge uh, props for doing that and get a lot of progress. And during while you're doing that, you can have other conversations about these kind of more far-fetched uh, ideas. Uh, you know, so find and fix those toil anti-patterns. And, uh, you know, the self-service operations uh, design pattern is something that is near and dear to our heart. Uh, I think we see a lot of people out there that it's where we've learned it from, seen in the community, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a valuable thing to kind of imprint into people's heads to help them go and solve those, uh, those anti-patterns. So I'll be around, um, uh, hang with the Rundeck folks or uh, in all the open spaces, so I'd love to talk to you guys. Um, let me know what you think, and I'd uh, love to collect more stories of uh, self-service. All right, thank you.